Okay, so we talked about that uproar, that was the silversmiths. Um, one key point here, uh, looking at some of the, um, what the scholars were saying, in verse three it says, he stayed about three months uh, there. Um, that is when they believed that Romans was written. Um, and so in Romans, uh, this is chapter 15, verse 25, it says, but now I'm going to Jerusalem uh, to minister to the saints. And they were putting together a timeline, and that's their best guess is, hey, that three-month period is probably when Romans was written. So get some context for that. All right, so where are we? Uh, so remember, they were in uh, Ephesus, right, here. Um, he could have just gone straight across uh, over to, really, he was going to Corinth, but instead uh, decided to go up through Macedonia. He's done this before. Um, I'm sure that allowed him to see other people, but he also had other reasons because of the people who were after him. Okay, and moving to verse 4. It says, And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also uh, Aristocrus, uh, Secundus the, of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychus, and uh, Trophimus of Asia. So lots of difficult words there, but um, this is kind of interesting. I, again, just looking at uh, what the people smarter than me had to say, and uh, so Peter, they said that there's no further information on him. Uh, all they know is that he's from Berea, as you get from this verse. So what do we know about Berea? They studied, right? So, uh, oh, well, the map's not there right now, but um, th that's up into Macedonia. And specifically, the Bereans were called out uh, for the good because they were studying daily to make sure that what Paul was saying fit in with Scripture, fit in with uh, the prophecies. Um, now, was so Peter amongst that group? We can kind of make that conclusion. So Peter is asked to uh, join them. Um, but other than that, we don't have anything in the Bible uh, from him. All right, how about uh, Aristocrus? Uh, I am going to ask somebody uh, to turn to Colossians uh, chapter 4. So he's mentioned uh, three other times. And in Colossians, uh, if someone can read that for us, it's Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. And the underlined ones, by the way, those are the ones I'm going to ask for, please. Aristocrus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do we learn from that? So, uh, sorry, if you couldn't hear that. He was his fellow prisoner, right? So he was imprisoned with Paul uh, in the future here. So th this is kind of a, a team that they're gathering. They're going to be splitting up here very shortly. But um, this was a large group of people that were following them, and he ended up being a prisoner with them. Uh, Secundus, there wasn't really uh, much other than that, other than he was with the Thessalonians. Uh, Gaius was likely a, a friend of Timothy. Uh, Timothy, of course, we all know. Can someone read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21? This is for uh, Tychius. Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 21. Okay, so that sounds like an important role. Two, two things. One is he was a minister, right? So he was preaching. Uh, he was not just there to help out in a managerial aspect, that type of thing. He was, he was actually preaching and teaching. And he said that he will make things known to you. So apparently he was carrying forth more message, uh, more information that uh, they needed. Uh, and then finally, uh, Trophimus. Um, if someone can read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. Okay, so what do we learn from that? Not a whole lot about him, except for one thing. He's human, right? He was sick. And this happens a lot. I mean, Timothy uh, was a good example. Um, so these are real people who are helping out. And we seem to have come across 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 6, several times over the past uh, three or four weeks, uh, it, it seems like to me anyway. Um, it says, I planted, that's Paul, I, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So this is a great example of all the different people who were involved in Paul's ministry at this time and how they 
ministered in different ways, right? They were not all the same. Uh, some of them were more uh, laborers, you could say, that type of thing. Some of them were preachers, but they all had a role to play, and without them, Paul could not have done what he done, what, done what he had done, um, and would not have been as successful as he was. Um, Yes. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So uh, if you didn't hear Keith, what he was saying was that Paul had the ability to heal, right? In fact, we're about to see it in just a moment uh, in a very um, epic fashion. But he did not heal Trophimus even though he could, because it would not have been for the right reasons. It would not have um, been an example of uh, Christ's power. All right, so what do we get from that section, though? And this, this goes back to the Sunday morning, uh, Sunday morning adult classes, by the way. We each have a role to play, right? We're not the same. Um, we're, we're not all going to... to be preaching or teaching um, up here, for example, um, but we all have a role to play, and it's up to us to, to fulfill that role. Okay, uh, turning to verse 5, chapter 20 again. These men, going ahead, waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Okay, so this is kind of a, a not a trick question, but I want y'all to, we're going to go back to that first passage. Okay, and do we have any English teachers in here by any chance? No? Okay. Uh, I was the world's worst English teacher, uh, English student, excuse me. Um, but... I, even I caught this. Okay, so in let's look at verse 5. I'm just going to read through this real quick. These men going ahead uh, waited for us at Troas. Uh, excuse me. I need to sync up here. Okay. Uh, after their uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over to that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Okay, do you all see how this is going here? Do y'all know what that's called in English? Third person, okay? So it, it, someone is writing. Who is who's writing this? This is in Acts. Luke, right? Okay. So Luke is writing this, and it's he, them, they, okay? And then this actually caught me off guard when I saw it. Um, these men going ahead waited for us at Churaz, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. What happened? It switched to first person. What does this mean? Yes, Luke was with them. Yeah, so Luke is now with him. Um, sometimes it, it's easy to miss little things in the Bible. The Bible is not, um, it does not have a like an outline and it shows you every little detail and points things out. No, it, sometimes you have to study, right? Like the Bereans. So here, uh, all of a sudden, Luke is with them, so he has joined them, and he is now, it, it's a first-person perspective versus uh, third. Um, verse 6, I just want to call out real quick. Uh, they were observing the days of unleavened bread. Now, why were they doing that? What was the days of unleavened bread? Yes, it, it involved with Passover, right? And so... With this, they're still holding to Jewish traditions. Remember, Paul frequently is teaching in the synagogues, right? So he would be going in, uh, doing things like that. Um, does this mean that we're supposed to do that? And that's right, we're not, but, but why? Yes, the old law has passed away. Now we're in the New Testament. Now we have the new law. It, we do have examples of where it is, uh, it, how does it phrase it, um, if you decide to hold a day special, things like that. So, yes, we can still do things like that, but this is different. But now we come to verse 7. 
Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Okay, so this is the first time that we are given an example in the New Testament of them coming together. Um, in, in this case, it's called to break bread. Um, but it's on the first day of the week. Why is that special? Why is that important? Yes, exactly. So it used to be the Sabbath, right? Um, so this is a, a good point to understand. Uh, we need to not be t too tautological on this, but we need to at least understand it so we can, with love, explain if, if someone, uh, if there's a misunderstanding. Do we observe the Sabbath on Sundays? No. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. That is a different thing. The Sabbath was on Saturday. Um, the Sabbath was on Saturday because it was the seventh day of the week, the day that God rested. It was a commandment that they were given in the Old Testament. And just like we were uh, saying about verse 6, we're now under the New Testament. Um, so, where else do we see things about the first day of the week? So, it, in Matthew 28, verse 1, um, I think this is important to, to point this out. It says, now, after the Sabbath... As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, right? So, why is the first day of the week important? Why, why was it chosen? What, what's different about it? That's the day of the resurrection. So, think about this. Um, if Christ had been crucified, and that was the end, there wouldn't be Christianity, Right? It was Christ's resurrection that fulfilled everything, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Him being crucified on the cross, that was the sacrifice. But if he wasn't able to be resurrected, it would have been for naught, right? So this was the observance of the resurrection. Acts 20, verse 7, we just read. And then 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when he, when he excuse me, when I come. Okay? So these are the, the two main um, examples that we have of them coming together on the first day of the week. Um, now something that, okay, maybe I am thinking a little too logically or technically here, but um, what's the first day of the week? Sunday. Why? Well, yeah, I know, exactly. Why? Everyone's like, what do you mean, why? <laughs> okay, so we we had the Julian calendar, right? That's why the months are the way they are. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope... <laughs> so, if you are in business, have you ever, like, opened up Microsoft Outlook or something, and uh, you, you look at your calendar, and what's the first day of the week? It depends on the settings. Okay, does that bother anybody other than me? <laughs> yeah, so I'm just saying it, it actually is Monday if you have your settings that way because in a business week, that's, that's your way you're looking. Um, anyway, I don't like that. I, I would rather it be, okay, this is the first way, week, everybody agree, and we'll move on. So anyway, I just think it was uh, very odd. But we are told to meet on the first day of the week. So the first day of the week we are uh, observing as Sunday. Yes, uh, yes, and it, again, things like that bother me too much. Okay, moving on to, ver uh, sorry, any, any questions or comments on that before we move on? Yes. Just one quick one. Yeah. When you there, it says he spoke at midnight. They were obviously meeting at night. Yes. And uh, if I could inject a point that's relevant to our study on Revelation there, Okay. One of the things that it wasn't a problem at this time yet, but a problem that later developed was that one of the accusations against Christians is that they were meeting and having secret meetings to subvert the government. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a, that was a lie, but it was based on them meeting at night because yes. Sunday wasn't you know a day of worship like it used to be in the United States, and it's fading away more and more and more. You know, it was just another work. Exactly. So when did they have the opportunity to meet? It was at night. Christians didn't have a temple made with hands like the false gods did. Mm -hmm. They worshipped like Jerusalem had for a while until it was destroyed. So that was one of the reasons they were accused of being atheists, because they didn't worship God the way they perceived God to be. So this is not a problem yet, but it will develop into a problem, the fact that they were meeting at night and meeting at long periods of time like yep. this. 
Exactly. They're not like us. They got to be caught in a scheme and doing something. Right. We we don't see everything that they're doing, so they must be up to uh, to no good. And actually, it is going to be uh, be important to somebody uh, really quick here. Um, and it's in this section. So in verse eight, uh, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, uh, who was uh, sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul w went down, fell on him, and embracing said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked for a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comfort. Okay, so... To your point, um, they were meeting at night. Again, even in this specific region, I don't even know how much the Sabbath, Saturday, would have been a work day, right? Because this was not a Jewish country that they're in here. Um, but even more so, to your point, they were meeting at night because this was a work day. Um, so they were late at night. Now, notice one thing is when Eutychus fell out of the window, then they immediately went and helped him. I think that's kind of important for us to understand. So a quick side story from when I was little. Um, so my father and I, we were on our way to church one morning, and um, we were stopping getting uh, gas at uh, Don Waldron's drugstore because they have gas too. It's strange. But anyway, so we were getting gas, and there was this elderly woman, and she fell down at the gas pump. Uh, I think gas was actually going everywhere. It, it was a pretty bad problem. And, of course, me, I'm an idiot. And so my father is sitting there helping her and all that. And I said, but dad, we're going to be late for church. Anyway, so hopefully I'm better now, but just pointing that out when I was six years old or whatever, I was uh, worse. So um, I think this is an important lesson that, yes, worship is important. But if there is a critical need, a truly critical need, this needs to be happen right now, then yes, we do need to take care of things. That has come up at least twice um, that I can remember in a worship service. Uh, we had one, uh, I don't remember exactly what the medical issue was, but uh, he needed to go to the emergency room. Uh, and then I had another one where we had to call an ambulance. Um, uh, he ended up uh, having, I'm not exactly sure, it was not a stroke, but something along those lines. So he immediately goes up to Eutychus. Now, here is a trick question. Was the window open? Was the window open? Yes? We have a yes. What does open imply? That it can be closed, right? There's no glass. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, they would not have had uh, glass in the windows at this time. So, this would be like an open portal. Um, he would have had a bench. And if I was listening to... Uh, something that was going on until early in the morning, I would appreciate a bench. But apparently, uh, he had been working all day and ended up falling out. So just once he did that, he, he made sure, Paul, made sure that he was okay. Um, he performed the miracle, brought him back. Now they go about and continue with worship. Okay, any comments, questions? Yes? In verse 8, the Holy Spirit doesn't yes. give us information people, if they had seen the lights and wondered what was going on and asked to come in, they would have been welcomed, right? So, I do want to talk about also, uh, it talks about they preached until midnight, he fell out of the window, and, and then um, they, it went on, it continued until daybreak. So, 
why? What, what was special about this versus our standard, like what we do on Sunday morning? What was different? Exactly. So they had a um, they had a, a huge benefit that we don't have, right? They had Paul. They had inspired teaching, but we have a huge benefit that they didn't have at the time. We have the Bible, right? We had information. Once Paul left, so let's say we had a guest preacher, and the pre guest preacher leaves, we're not stuck, right? <laughs> we can continue reading the Bible. We can continue studying. We can do things on our own time, whereas. Uh, this was going to be uh, the end for uh, Paul here. Okay, let's go to verse 13. It says, When they went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, uh, they're intending to take Paul aboard, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go afoot, on foot. excuse me. And when he met at Assos, uh, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came to Chios. The next day uh, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Troglium. The next day we came to uh, Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the date of Pentecost. Okay, so he is going out of his way to avoid Ephesus. Why is that? Do you think that he would be a help or a hindrance to the Christians at Ephesus at this time? A help? He definitely, he still was inspired, right? He could still teach them. He could still do a lot of things for them. But what would it have done if he had gone to Ephesus? Yeah, it would have drawn the attention to him, right? And there are a lot of people against him. So whether it was, you know, Paul, the best way to say it would be Paul through the Holy Spirit decided, hey, the best course of action is to avoid Ephesus so that they can continue on without that additional, additional turmoil. Okay, so we had talked about uh, Passover. Um, and here we get to uh, verse 16 uh, at the end, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so what was Pentecost? There's kind of two right answers to this. The day the church was established, exactly. So going back to Acts, I forgot if that was chapter 1 or 2, but uh, early in Acts, we had um, the church being established on the day of Pentecost. How about the Old Testament? Yes, a day when all the Jews would come together. And specifically, what was, what were they worshiping? Or not worshiping, that's not the right term. What were they celebrating? So this was the harvest and in particular, the, the wheat harvest. Um, so I thought it was uh, kind of a good thing to point out that, you know, wheat is, you know, your bread, your daily bread. We just talked about in uh, verse 7 about they came together to break bread. Bread is basic sustenance, right? And now Jesus is our basic sustenance. So th there's kind of a lot of symbolism that... Uh, people who were bad at English class miss, uh, but I think this is one of them. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in the, the days that uh, were chosen here. Any comments, questions on that? Okay. All right. In that case, let's go to verse 17. It says, From Miletus, uh, he went to, uh, excuse me, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And uh, when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to, uh, to Asia, in what manner I always lived amongst you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing uh, that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and uh, taught you pu publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus. This was not very far. Uh, it's just down the, the coast uh, to the south. Um, he, sent the, he sent a request for the elders to come to him, again, for the reasons we just discussed. So these elders, he's using them to communicate uh, what he needed to. 
A um, couple of things to point out in verse 20, uh, house to house. So are any of y'all familiar with house to house, heart to heart? Um, so that, that's part of where that comes from. But specifically in verse 20, notice it says two, two different ways. It calls out two different ways, publicly and house to house. So that goes back to uh, what we're learning on Sunday mornings where there are different ways of reaching people. Not every way is best for every uh, person, but we need to do them all. Um, okay, any questions or comments on this before we move to the next? Okay. And in verse 22, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear uh, to myself, so that uh, I may finish the race with glory and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. All right, so Paul, he's setting a rather somber tone, isn't he? He knows what's going to happen. I don't think he quite knows the timeline, right? He doesn't know how fast or anything like that necessarily, but he knows what's going to happen. He's trying to communicate this to them. Um, notice his attitude in here, uh, verse 24, so that I might may finish my race with joy. So this goes back to what we were talking about several weeks ago, maybe a month or more ago, where a lot of Christianity if we have our mind on the long term, the eternal, the spiritual, all of a sudden the things in, in this world, I mean, it's nothing. It's like vapor, right? Um, so I think that is the key thing that I get out of this is, hey, first of all, Christianity, life, is a race, right? One of the things about a race is there's an end, an end in the sense that this uh, life on earth will come to an end, and then we have the eternal. Um, but the other extremely important part is the attitude that he's going about it with. He's going about it with joy. He's been persecuted a lot, right? Maybe he deserved it, you could say. Uh, a lot of, he did a lot of persecuting early on in his life. But he's been persecuted a lot, and yet he is still joyful. He is still um, happy and content, um, which actually was one of my favorite verses uh, from his later on. Any questions, comments on this section? All right, so his instructions to these elders is coming up. It says in verse 26, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And continuing to verse 29, For I know this, that when my departure, excuse me, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in amongst you, not sparing the flock. Also from amongst yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Okay, so remember, who is he talking to again? The elders of Ephesus, right? Um, and what is his warning? Th there's going to be false teachers, right? Were these false teachers already there? So one of the things about false teachers, I don't know, a lot of times we tend to think that they come from the outside or, or they maybe they're not even coming from the outside. They just are outside, right? So you see some televangelist saying, send me all your money and great things will happen, things like that. But false teachers can come from anywhere. They can be, unfortunately, it can come from within the church, and that's one of the primary things that the elders are responsible for making sure it doesn't happen, right? They're responsible for making sure that we remain faithful. What about our role the, the, for the non-elders of us? What, what's our role in this? Anyone who's not an elder want to answer? <laughs> what is our role against false teaching? Search the scripture. Sorry. 
to point it out, yes, to, to raise the alarm, right? Just because we're a sheep, yes, that's the right plurality there, just because we're a sheep doesn't mean that we have no responsibility, we'll just let the elders take care of it. It's our job to alert the elders if there's a problem, right? Um, notice again, you have the imagery here, the elders, also called shepherds, um, versus the wolves. Okay, any questions, comments on that? Yes. Yeah, back at uh, verses 26 and 27. Okay. He makes an important statement there. He, he's, he's saying, I've taught you the whole gospel. I didn't hide anything from you. I didn't avoid things that people consider to be controversial. I did not talk about things that some people might not feel comfortable about. I did not talk about those things that people might consider to be offensive. Mm -hmm. Because he knew that everybody needed to hear the saving gospel. And that goes back to what... God told Ezekiel when he told him in chapter 3 where he tells him I made you a watchman over the house of Israel and he tells him that if he, if he doesn't warn the wicked then both the wicked is going to die and he's going to require the blood of him that basically their blood was going to be on him because he didn't tell them everything they needed to know so that's a, that's a significant statement there because we can, go, we can go years and years and years and say well we taught the Bible but we avoid certain topics right. that people don't want to hear. And so all we're going to do is say things that everybody agrees with. We haven't taught the whole gospel. Right. And so the blood of people's souls that are lost because we didn't teach them everything they needed to know is on us. That, that's a very important concept. So about. that's a great point. And specifically in the old, at this time period, what would those, what would those uh, controversial topics have been? Circumcision, that was the, the number one, one I was thinking of. But, but there's others. I'm sorry? Doing away with the law, away with the law. yes. Um, sacrificing foods to idols, especially around the area that they're in. Yes, so all of these things would have been controversial, and to your point, he taught them. He taught them that, hey, I know you're not comfortable with this, but this is the way that it needs to be. He went ahead and did it. Now, how about us? There's a lot of controversial things that we don't talk about a whole lot. There's also a, a positive and negative way of teaching and preaching, and there needs to be a balance there, to be honest. Uh, I, I have uh, been in congregations before where it was uh, very negative. Basically, it's like, okay, Here's the route to hell. Here's the few things that you might be able to do maybe to get away with not going there. Whoa. I mean, like, very negative. Uh, constantly, like, uh, very, very negative. And that's wrong. But what about the, uh, here's, there actually is a book named I'm Okay, You're Okay, by the way. I just found that out a few years ago. But anyway, the I'm Okay, You're Okay type philosophy where, yeah, we're all good. Hey, come, come to church. We'll have a good time, that type of thing, right? Thank you. So that's not okay either. To your point, we have to teach the whole gospel. We have to touch on the subjects that are uncomfortable. And we also need to balance out that, Yes, we have great things with the Bible, but if we not choose not to do them, there's a bad outcome too. Okay. Um, we have only a few minutes left, so let's go to verse 32. Oh, sorry. It's all about motivation. It's all based on what, you know, what our motivation is, what the objectives are, because like what was talked about earlier about love. I mean, love is... Love is understanding what is in everybody's best interest. And there are things, there are activities, there are behaviors that God has told us in his word that are wrong. They're contrary to love. And so we have to tell people about that. Obviously, you don't tell them in a mean way because right. the motivation is, is you want them to change. You don't change people by, you know, trying to see how mean you can be to them. But on the other hand... If it's not love, it's not you don't looking out for their best interest to say, well, I don't ever want to bring this up because they'll get right. mad at me. Yeah. So, so no. it, as you right. say, it takes both, but we have to do both. Yes. Okay, uh, verse 32 says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up 
and give you an inheritance amongst all who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Uh, yes, you know, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of, Jesus, of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to, to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then he wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrow, sorrowing more of all the words uh, which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. So, rather somber end to this chapter. Um, so this is uh, most likely going to be the last that they see of Paul, and they, they know this, they know where he's going, uh, they know the trials that are uh, sending him to, and yet they are in agreement. They understand that this is a necessity. They're not saying, no, Paul, don't go, let's run away and, you know, you live another 40 years. Yeah, this is what needed to happen. Okay. All right, so let's uh, close out with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for everything that you've given to 